On the evening of September 4th, 1964, 28-year-old Donald Schrum, along with two friends, Vincent Alvarez and Tim Trueblood, were hunting in the Tahoe National Forest near Cisco Grove, California. All had considerable experience bow hunting, and all were overall general outdoorsmen. On this particular night, after having established a camp, they found themselves hunting for deer. Perhaps due to their comfort in the outdoor environment, with the night fast approaching no less, all agreed that they would push deep into the woods in pursuit of their targets. And if they had to, spend the night in the woods and rendezvous back in the camp in the morning. Before long, all three of them found themselves separated from one another, looking for their potential targets. With daylight losing the battle against the night, Shrum would make the decision to find somewhere to bed down for the night. Or, more accurately, bed up. Shrum had with him a military-style belt which allowed for him to secure himself in a tree. Given the number of wild animals who might wish to turn the tables on the hunter, Shrum believed this was a preferable option to camping on the ground, alone and ultimately defenseless. Shortly after securing himself for the night, a strange light appeared in the distance. Of more concern to Shrum was a zigzagging pattern around the trees at low altitude, which headed towards him. Thinking his two friends had arranged a search for him in the form of a helicopter, he jumped from the tree and quickly released three of his flares to give away his destination. As he was waving his arms and yelling for attention, he began to realize what was heading his way wasn't a rescue helicopter after all. The glowing object finally stopped around 50 yards from his position. It was spherical, but unlike anything he'd ever seen before. He quickly made his way back up the tree, making sure his bow was ready. Fear was now rising at a seemingly unstoppable rate within him. That fear would rise even more when three small humanoid creatures emerged from the craft and began making their way straight towards him. As they came closer, he could see that while two of them were most definitely humanoid, the third was more robot-like. The two humanoids began to shake the tree, obviously in an effort to force him from it. He would cling on with all his strength. However, when a white vapor shot out from the robotic creature's mouth, he later realized he was knocked unconscious. Only momentarily, however. Aside from an intense feeling of nausea, he was unharmed. He began lighting the matches he used for his flares, dropping them towards the menacing trio in an effort to force them away. Although they would back away for a short while, they soon continued their assault. By this time, Shrum had managed to load an arrow into his bow and let it fly. It soared into the robot's direction. Seconds later, a shower of sparks flew into the air, suggesting a direct hit. As quickly as he could, he fired two more arrows in the general vicinity of the creature's location, causing all of them to back away. However, before he could take advantage of the situation, a second robot appeared, and once again, a white vapor hit Shrum and caused him to lose consciousness again. When he awoke this final time, he was alone. There was no sign of the ship having returned, but all the creatures, including the robots, were gone. He dropped himself from the tree, dazed, tired, but largely unhurt. He would set out for the prearranged meeting place of the campsite from the previous afternoon. Once there, he would discover both of his friends waiting for him as planned. Incidentally, all three of the men would return to the destination later that day after hearing Shrum's incredible story. They did find several of the arrows he had fired, as well as several pieces of charred clothing. His two friends would believe his claims, though, in part due to Alvarez's own sighting of the glowing craft leaving the scene. However, when Shrum's mother-in-law, upon hearing of the encounter, 
told an astronomer friend from the local college, things begin to take a gritty turn. The astronomer would immediately contact the nearby McClelland Air Force Base. He would inform them of the account and the location of the witness. Even more bizarre, instead of visiting him at his home to listen to his version of events, even though he had not yet made any sort of report, they would arrange to meet in an empty house at an off-base housing development. Shrum would agree to the meeting. The two officers present would listen to his account and then confiscate several of the arrows. Later claims suggested that these had shavings of the robot on them. Then the officers insisted that what he had just described to them hadn't happened, or not in the way he remembered. Furthermore, they would present several alternative scenarios, as if giving him the opportunity to pick one for himself. He would eventually agree that he wasn't certain of what he'd seen, if for no other reason than to keep his employers from facing similar questions. Shrum has stuck to the same story and version of events for over half a century. I'm going to leave you with an audio clip of an interview conducted by UFO researcher and author Ruben Uriarte. For a complete and comprehensive look at this case, be sure to purchase the book Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Incident, co-written by Uriarte and Notorious. In this exclusive interview, you'll hear Shrum recount that harrowing day in his own words. And I heard some thrashing through the brush in probably five, ten minutes. These two humanoids come out of the brush and they kind of broke some of the brush off and, and uh, was looking at it. And then they came straight underneath the tree and looked up at me. And I, I knew right then I was fingered. <laughs> they found you. Yeah, they found me. Can you describe them for us? Tell us briefly what they Yeah, were. they were, looked like uh, four to five feet. Of course, I'm looking down at them, so they, they'd be shorter than they probably are. And uh, they had a silvery, like a one-piece uh, suit on, and it seemed like it had the, the, the joints, puffy joints, you know, on the shoulders and the, and the elbows, and, and the legs I didn't see that clear. Were you able to see their faces? No, uh, it was just a kind of a dark shadow. I could see the, the two uh, like eyes that were looked like welding goggles to me. They were the same as welding goggles. They're about two inches in diameter. It reminded me just, like I said, like a w welding goggles. And then the rest of the face was kind of a uh, blur. I couldn't see looking down at them. Then I saw two flashing red orange eyes just picking its way down the ridge, just between the rocks and, and around them and everything, and come down and was on the, this big boulder, this big flat rock. And then uh, he kind of looked up at me and he moved his hand through the fire cinders and kind of scattered them. Then he come down uh, up on the rock. He was about seven feet from me. And uh, then he, he touched his mouth and uh, kind of a steam vapor come out of his mouth and it lit up his face so I could see some detail and then uh, I, I blacked out when that steam hit me it kind of took the air from me and I'd gas for air and then black out and I fell over my bow and that's the only thing that kept me in the tree and then uh, so I figured they were out to get me then the eyes of this other uh, creature like uh, the robot, what, what did that look like to you? It had uh, kind of like fire, it's kind of a orangish, reddish orange or yellowish orange. It kind of flickered like fire and they're about the same diameter as uh, about two inches in diameter as the humanoids. I had a 60 pound bow which is a very high velocity. Since seeing how the robot is the only thing that was causing me harm. I shot the chest area, and it has the velocity of a rifle at that at that distance, because I'm only about seven, eight feet from him. And it, when I hit the chest, the sparks would fly like an arc welder, kind of. And then that, that robot backed up and almost knocked him down. He kind of fell back against the rock. And then I, I ran out of uh, arrows, so I only had three left. 
and uh, I thought, well, I had, that's when pomade hair <laughs> is just, I mean, the, the cap I had on was just soaked with oil. You're, this is for your hair, pomade. Yeah, from my hair, yeah, 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 okay. pomade. And uh, I always carried uh, all kinds of books of matches with me when I hunted. And so I lit that cap and it just blazed up and I dropped it down the base of the tree. And just in that instant, they, they moved back about 12, 15 feet. And the, the, I, I glanced over at the, the ship that was uh, over the canyon, kind of almost level with me. And it was almost out of sight. It was just like a star. It moved that fast, just in that second. So then I got the idea that they're scared of fire. So I, I burned everything but my t-shirt and my jeans and uh, come to find out later on that, that it was 32 degrees out and I was shaking and kind of overexposed for the weather. Well, when I throw, threw my, after my hat, I threw my canteen down and uh, they, they picked it up and looked at it and, and threw it back down. When I run out of stuff to burn, I headed for the top of the tree and then, uh, then I'd, I'd uh, I, it was a pretty sparse tree I could see down to the ground. And I broke off the top and threw it down. And, and any time I'd throw down or, or shake the tree, these humanoids would back up. When I was up in the top of that tree, I uh, thought about just jumping off and jumping down the canyon and just killing myself. But the only thing that kept me going is I had a, the little girl, my wife, and that kept me fighting. <laughs>